Well, we open our hearts today, God. By a will of our own, we shut off our natural mind and we click into the supernatural mind. Lord, take away this stony heart of ours and give us this heart of flesh. God, I thank you this morning. You make a way in the wilderness. You make a way where there is no way. You make a way in the desert. And Lord, we don't know how, but we know who. And we give you all the praise. We give you all the glory for crying out loud, Lord. We're coming and getting it this morning. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh, manifest your presence in the house this morning, Jesus. Oh, for crying out loud. Oh. the sermon this morning is to be a champion for God you have to be growing in God now I really want you to get this one so before you sit down you have to look at somebody somebody you don't normally look at husbands and wives you can't look at each other you got to get out of your chair and go look at somebody you don't know and say to be a champion for God you have to be growing in God say it again to be a champion for God you have to be growing in God, and then you may be seated. Give you a little introduction this morning, and then we'll watch just a short clip of video to put us on the right page and in the right mindset. Did you ever notice that the eye gate really wars with the spirit? So we're going to put something in the eye gate so that we can arrest the spirit man, the soul man, and get him to settle down so he can learn something this morning. Amen? We're going to be talking about to be a champion for God, you have to be growing in God. But in all actuality, the meat of the message is the fruit of the spirit. Now, the spirit has a fruit. If you are in the spirit, a fruit of the spirit will manifest in your life it's not fruits all right there's one spirit there is one fruit but there are many manifestations of the fruit of the spirit so it's not like nuts fruits and flakes okay it's a fruit of the spirit nothing nutty nothing flaky about it glory to god and it's what we all want to grow in. You all are way too serious. I'm talking about nuts, fruit, and flakes, and you guys are looking at me like I'm talking about death and hell and leftovers, all right? Hallelujah. But I'm talking about a good thing this morning, amen? It's a biblical term that sums up the nine visible fruits of a Christian or a true Christian's life. These nine fruits of the Spirit are evident in our life when we are in Christ. Elbow your neighbor and say, in Christ. When the Holy Spirit controls our lives rather than the forces of the flesh. That would have been another good title. The forces 
of the flesh. But in all actuality, when the Spirit controls our life rather than the forces of our flesh, the Spirit will produce nine-fold fruit that characterizes all who truly walk in the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is a physical manifestation of a transformed life. Let me shake that bush again. The fruit of the Spirit is a physical manifestation of a transformed life. You'll know that your life is transformed when you start to see these nine fruits. If you don't see these nine fruits in your life, then you perhaps might check your transformation process. By transformation process, I mean how much of the word are you getting in? How much of his presence are you getting in? Because the Bible says in his presence we are changed. All right? So if we're not being changed, we're maybe, maybe not in his presence enough. Now, when Paul was writing the book of Galatians, which is where we're going to be this morning, we're going to be in Galatians uh, chapter 5, verses 22 through 23, if you're wanting to look ahead in your Bibles. When Paul was writing this book of Galatians, he was very upset over the situation in Galatia. He had visited the area on his first missionary journey, and he had nurtured the young Christians by encouraging them to break away from anything that would separate them from experiencing the fullness of Jesus Christ. That was a big job. But he did it by encouraging. Notice he didn't by, beat, by beating them. He didn't do it by barraging them. He didn't do it by correcting and chastising them and being hard on them. He was encouraging them. We can learn right there. If we want people to be better, if we want people to become all that God has them to be, then we need to become encouragers. Amen? Amen. And everybody can be an encourager. After he left to go elsewhere to preach, there were certain ultra-conservative Jewish Christians known as Judaizers who threatened both Paul's authority and his message by telling those Galatians, remember, those were those young baby Christians that he was encouraging to walk in the Spirit. He, they started telling the Galatians that their faith was not sufficient unless they kept certain laws. One of the laws was circumcision. Another of the laws was doing certain penance and giving certain amounts of money and stuff. And Paul was like, you're ruining it because if you get a person to walk in the Spirit and grow in the Spirit, you won't have to put them under the law because they'll want to do what the Spirit wants them to do. See, there's that freedom that comes. It's not, I got to, it's I get to. Amen? So, in Christ, our relationship to God has been restored. Now, that's a good place to shout, hallelujah! I said, in Christ, our relationship to God has been restored, not by something we do, but rather by something God has already done. I am not restored to God my Father and walk in uprightness and justification and sanctification because of something I do, but something Jesus already did. See, you can relax this morning. You don't have to, ooh, try to be a Christian. All you have to do is just be what God created you to be and rest and relax in that. And you think, Pastorina, I'll backslide. You know, you don't understand. If I don't try not to go to the bar, I'll end up at the bar. No, you won't. After this morning's message, you're going to have your head turned 360 degrees, and you're going to say, you know what? I was making it harder than it had to be. Isn't that what we do? I mean, I can start out having fun, and all of a sudden I make it work. That's got to be my fallen nature. I mean, when my kids were little, I'd say, come on, we're going to have fun. We're going to bake cookies today. We're going to have so much fun. And before it was over, I was like, don't eat the dough. Don't drop flour on the thing. You know, don't put your hands in that. You know, go wash your hands. And before it was over, they were like, this is not fun, Mommy. We don't want to bake cookies with you. So now they grew up, and I'm like, hey, come over and bake cookies. And they go, that's all right, Mom. No thanks. You know, had enough of that when we were kids, right? And see, that's the way some of us have been grown up in Christ. Don't cuss. Don't drink. Don't smoke. Don't go there. Don't hang out with those people. Don't do that. Don't wear that. Can't go see that. Can't go do that. And so you know what? We're like, okay, I've had enough of church, right? And nobody wants to come to that kind of church. But see, if we have the kind of church where we have a relationship with God, 
and we're free to be us. And we know that we're so in love with him that it's, you don't have to tell me what I can't do. I wouldn't want to do it anyway. Because I'm so in love with him that you don't have to tell me that. Just like I wouldn't have an affair on my husband because I love him, why would I not do something for God? Amen? So, Paul is trying to tell him, no, 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 don't ruin it. I'm talking to these people's hearts, and I'm encouraging them that they're doing really good. Don't put them back under the law. Jesus came to fulfill the law, so they don't have to feel like they're under that. So when we, we Christians fully get a grasp of that, we can in, begin to enjoy freedom to live. The Apostle Paul believed that as long as we were self-serving, self-serving, another definition is focusing on the flesh, we're not free. If you notice, when your flesh wants something, go eat. Aren't you hungry? Don't you want those sweets? You want those shoes? You want that car? You need to go check that car. That car's going to get sold if you don't go get it. You know, those shoes are going to be gone if you don't go get it. You better call so-and-so, they're mad at you. If you don't call so-and-so, they're going to be offended at you. The flesh drives. It's a shouting self-fulfilling go go do do be be more more and the spirit is freedom you can tell that the spirit is working in you when you can say no really don't want those shoes <laughs> if the car gets sold it's not it's not the will of god if the truck's not there when i get back it wasn't meant to be and you be about god's business and he'll be about your business and who knows, you might let that car sit there long enough, they think they can't sell it, and they take off a few thousand. Just saying, right? So sometimes we are so caught up in the business of serving ourselves, we fail to become the person we're capable of becoming. Everybody shout, believe. believe. See, inside of every single one of you, there is a dream, and it's a dream that God gave you because the devil doesn't give you a dream. Inside of every one of you is greatness, and it was given to you by God because the devil doesn't give you greatness inside of every single one of you is a tenacity to want to be loved and to want to love inside of every single one of you there is something and the devil's after it and sometimes he he hauls off and he hits you so hard you're staggering in life going i don't think i can live this christian life you don't know how hard it is you don't know what it's like living with this or living with that you don't know what it's like being in an office where everybody's a heathen and everybody's going out and everybody's talking like this yes i do and you know what? There's somebody greater than us that knew how to do that. His name is Jesus. And you know what? It said, sometimes you just need to see somebody else see it's possible so that you can do it too. You know what? Jesus became a man, and he showed us that it is possible. So all we have to do is keep our eyes on Jesus. Amen? Jesus ran the four-minute mile, if you would. Jesus reviled not when he was reviled again. Jesus sinned not when he was uh, tempted. Jesus did not compromise when compromise was sitting in front of him. Jesus is our model. Amen? And we can become what Jesus became if we keep our eyes on Jesus. The Bible doesn't lie. And it said when we see him, we will be like him. Are you ready for the fight of your life? Because that's what you have to do. And you fight the good fight, and you know what the fight is? It's the fight of faith. And you fight it by getting so strong in the word of God that everything seems possible. Because through the eyes of faith, all things are possible. Amen? Galatians 5, 22 and 23, if you'll turn there with me. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And you know what's interesting? There are nine. And you know what the number nine means? Harvest. That means something's got to be planted in order for something to grow. It means something's got to get in you before it can come out of you. If you want a harvest, you put something in so that you can get something out. Isn't it true? So in discussing these fruits of the Spirit, there are nine graces often and divided into three groups. Are you ready for these nine fruit? Here we go. The first one is what I, I would call love for God. 
and it's in the category love joy and peace are in a category that is directed up it's real easy to remember these if you do this there are three directed up there are three directed out and there are three directed in it's a really good way to remember them three of these nine graces are directed up three of them are directed out and three of them are directed in now the ones that are directed up are the ones that turn our thoughts towards God. So when you think about the ones that turn your thoughts toward God, you look up. These are the ones directed up. Then there are those that cause us to have attention on our fellow man. Those are the ones that are directed out because I'm looking at the outward way. And then the ones that are directed in refer directly to myself. All right, so the three graces that turn our thoughts towards God or are directed up are love, joy, and peace. The reason those are directed up is because where there is no love where there is no God. There is no joy where there is no God. And there is no peace where there is no God. So we have to look to God who can give us love, which is the love for God. Joy, to rejoice in the Lord. You notice I didn't say happiness. Because happiness is when all the happenings are right. But see, when all the happenings are wrong... When unemployment is skyrocketing, which I prophesy it will, these messages don't come by accident. They come by much prayer and supplication. When you find yourself in the ring of life because life hasn't treated you harshly, are you going to continue to fight the good fight of faith? Because, see, when the happenings are wrong, you can still pull up joy from the inside of you because joy comes from the Lord. Many of you have heard this story over and over and over again. But when my house was burning, the happenings were not good. But I looked over at an apostle and my spiritual father, Dr. John, and they were smiling. And Dr. John looked at Apostle John and he goes, I wasn't going to smile until I see it if you were smiling. If you were smiling, I was going to smile. And, and, and Joe was smiling. And I was like wanting to tear him up. Like, what are you smiling about? And Joe had this supernatural joy on the inside of him that everything was going to be all right. And I was worried about my toothbrush. And this little boy from next door neighbor, he came over and he had his little Batman toothbrush and he said, Aunt Weena, because up there on the hill, we called it Baby Mountain. Everybody was aunt and uncles, whether they were related to you or not. And he goes, Aunt Weena, I brought you my toothbrush. Sammy Salento, if you're watching, it's all about you, buddy. But anyway... They had a supernatural joy in the midst of this, that it came from God. So love, joy, and peace. But now let's look at the ones that are directed out. You take your eyes off God for just a minute, and you've got to look at people. And when you've got to look at people, you have to be, number one, long-suffering, kindness, and goodness. Long-suffering. Ooh, Jesus help me. Kindness. Goodness. Those are the ones that we need when we want to have a relationship with people, right? And remember, it shouldn't be like, oh, I've got to be kind to them. Oh. I'm being long-suffering. I'm really being long-suffering here. I'm so long-suffering, right? No. Does an apple tree go, oh, I've got to produce an apple today. Oh. Oh, right? No, it's not like that. An apple tree does what? It produces apples because that's what it is. See, when I'm a Christian and my roots grow down deep and I'm rooted and grounded in God and I search for waters hidden, the watering of the word, I am a tree of righteousness planted in the courts of our God and I will bear forth fruit at all seasons I am instant in season and out of season why because that's who I am and so I am long suffering not because I have to be not because I've got to produce it not because of some law on top of me but because that's what I am I'm just an apple tree and I just produce what's in me what's in me comes out of me it's not hard the revelation that you're a tree of righteousness that you're rooted and grounded in God 
and that that's who you are has to become a reality than the ones that are directed in. They refer more to myself. Faithfulness. Gentleness. Self-control. Sometimes we're not gentle with ourselves. And if you're harsh with you, you'll find it really easy to be harsh with others. When you're not faithful to the promises you've made on the inside of you, you'll find it's real easy not to be faithful to the people on the outside. If you are not having self-control, telling yourself no when no one's watching, how will you be able to have self-control when everyone's watching? Dag Hammerschlag, famous German, said in his autobiography, the road to holiness necessarily passes through the world of action. So you can say I'm holy, but until you start acting on your holiness and start interacting with the world, you won't really know what's in you. I've been surprised sometimes what come out of me. Am I by myself this morning? I've been surprised sometimes at the harshness, the shortness, the cruelty. But see, God knew it was in there all along. It just hadn't had time to manifest yet. See, inside that apple tree, when it starts to bloom... There is an apple. In that apple tree, when it starts to lose its leaves and it starts to look hard in the winter of life, inside it, there's still an apple tree. Inside of you, when you're in Christ, are all the good things. Don't get discouraged. They may not have just come out yet, but they'll come out. You just wait. You just watch. You'll see. Paul tells the Galatians in this text that we've been called to freedom, not as an opportunity to serve ourselves, but to serve others. An apple tree doesn't produce a fruit, so it can turn its branch in and go. That'd be pretty scary if it did. Steven Spielberg would be like, ah, write that movie, right? Paul carefully defines freedom and what it requires. He reveals that freedom in Christ is not a freedom towards self-indulgence, rather the exercise of loving service to the world you know jesus he could have called all these angels down to get him off the cross when they came at him he could have just like went good thing nobody was sitting in the front row they got wet you didn't pick it up put it in your eyes and it'll make your eyes see better right hallelujah but self-indulgent seems to be a pretty apt word for our society today you know lucy in the comic strip is often a poster child for self-indulgent philosophy and reading a book to Lucy, Linus says, it says here the world revolves around the sun once a year. Lucy replies, the world revolves around the sun? Are you sure? I thought it revolved around me. And see, so many times we come to church because what? We think it's all about me. Well, I hope the service is good today. I hope Julian sings good today. Hope Pastorina's not singing today. <laughs> Just kidding <laughs> But seriously, it's all about what we want, right? When all it really matters is, did God show up? And when he did, did I recognize it? And in his manifestation, was there a transformation in me? Did I leave differently than when I came in? Amen? This kind of thinking seems to be reflective of our culture and our church. Just look at some of the self-help books that are bent on helping us feel happy. Listen to a good number of electronic preachers today, and you would assume that the sole purpose is to preach everybody happy and prosperous. But those who are guided by the fruit of the Spirit know that true happiness and fulfillment is not found in serving ourselves, but in serving others. Did you ever notice how good you feel when you do something for someone else? Did you ever make somebody's day? Did you ever surprise somebody and do something so nice that they never dreamed that that would happen to them? And they were so changed by that moment. And instead of their heart growing three sizes, yours did. I love the movie The Grinch That Sold Christmas. I think about it so often. 
because he took all their gifts. He took all of their tinsel. He took all of their pies. He took all of the things that made Christmas Christmas down in Whoville. And when he got up to the pinnacle, his sleigh was filled with everything that he had taken from the little people that lived in Whoville. And he heard singing. I'm really a kid at heart. And he couldn't figure out what it was. And it says, without the tinsel, without the tree, without the pies, without the schnitzel, without everything, Christmas still came to Whoville. And at that moment, his heart grew three sizes. Do you realize, Whoville people, that when we do right in the midst of wrong, when we can still sing songs of praises in the midnight hour, when we can still see beauty in ashes, the Grinches of this world's hearts will change. And they'll come in because they want what we have. There are two things about Salvation um, uh, Army officers' uniforms I'd like to tell you about. They have two brass buttons on their lapel of their jacket. There's an S and another S. And one of the S's stands for saved by Jesus Christ, but the other S stands for service. And it lets the world know that they've been saved for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to serve. And see, when we realize that when we produce fruit in our life, it's to serve others. All of a sudden, the reason we do it changes. This is a powerful reminder that we have been set free by Christ so we can serve the needs of a human family, especially the least, the lost, and the lonely. We're able to do that if we can be free from serving ourselves. If I realize I am not getting my identity from serving so that it can fulfill me because I have low self-esteem, but I'm serving others and I'm not doing it to satisfy my flesh, I'm doing it because I love God. And because I love God so much, I want to serve His people because He loves, I love. 